We're delighted to host Janine De Giovanni uh, for her new book, The Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophets. The Vanishing is the, the, the main title. Uh, it's received uh, some very nice reviews in uh, Kirkus, her latest poignant book, uh, publishes weekly. This very informative work of journalism on book list. She writes with poignant authenticity uh, and many others. Um, Beautiful evocations of the power of faith in trying times, the Wall Street Journal. Um, so Janine, thanks for being here. Uh, you're a fellow, senior fellow at uh, the Jackson School at Yale. Uh, you're a former Guggenheim fellow, uh, also a fellow at, at New America, uh, won multiple awards, have written multiple books. Uh, so we're really pleased that you uh, uh, can talk to us about, about this book, which is, is this your sixth book? It's my ninth, which is ninth. terrifying. <laughs> yes, but it just means how how old I'm getting. Okay, well, uh, your ninth book. Okay, it's maybe your sixth book since I've known you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, so Janine, over to you if you can kind of tell us what the Great. book. Okay. Peter, thank you so much for having me. First of all, um, it's it's a pleasure to be here, and and so this book, The Vanishing. Um, has a kind of long history for me. I, I began working in the Middle East, really the working in the Middle East was my very, very first assignment back in 1990. I mean, literally straight out of graduate school. And um, I was then working in, in Israel, Palestine. And I came across groups of ancient Christians as well as Samaritans, biblical ancient people. Um, groups of people that had been in this part of the world for, for thousands and thousands of years and had somehow maintained their culture, their tradition. Um, but really when I was in Iraq in 2002 to 2003, in the time of Saddam, um, was when I first discovered the Christians of Iraq. Um, at that time, it was remarkable, really. I don't know if you remember those days of the Saddam days, but they were very heavily enforced. If you were a reporter or a humanitarian, anyone who managed to get inside Iraq, you were you were heavily monitored by uh, the Mukhabarat, the secret police, um, and you 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 were watched everywhere. It was very difficult to move around, but somehow, and I still can't believe my luck. Um, I got permission to travel. It was right before the invasion in 2003 to basically travel the entire length and width of Iraq um, to, to meet different people. I was doing an assignment, I think, for National Geographic on the Shias of Iraq. And I realized even while I was getting in my car with my driver, with my fixer, that this was probably the last time in my lifetime anyway, I would see Iraq before the invasion, the old Iraq, the way that Iraq had been. Um, and it was very true because as from April, 2003, when the American invasion and the coalition occurred, nothing was ever the same. But some of the people I met were the Christians in Mosul and the Nineveh Plain, the biblical Nineveh, Nineveh Plain, where, which was of course the, the land of the prophets where um, the apostles had gone to, to preach, to bear witness, um, to gain um, people to follow them, um, where Jonah and the whale, of course, the, the tale of Jonah and the whale, where St. Thomas, where all of these ancient preachers went to build monasteries and to gather, um, gather people. Um, and the more time I spent with these people who were largely Chaldeans, Assyrians, there were some Syriac, some uh, Eastern Orthodox, um, many different sects. The more fascinated I was by how ancient people cling to the roots. They speak Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus Christ. So one of my most poignant memories right before the invasion was going to a mass um, an Assyrian mass in a beautiful church in Mosul and hearing them praying and singing and this kind of collective fear they had because they didn't know what would happen 
Saddam had protected the Christians in many ways, which is also what happens in Syria. Uh, Bashar al-Assad protects the Christians there. In Egypt, Mubarak had protected the Christian cops. So these Iraqi Christians in 2003 were terrified about what, what would happen in the days, weeks, months, years after the invasion occurred. So after that, I basically spent years um, going back to these places. And I decided to focus in my book on four communities, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Gazans, because there are 800 Christians left in Gaza. And even for me, and I've been working in Gaza for since 1990, so a long time, I never realized that there was this very small, but very determined and very devout um, group of Christians who had been left behind from the fourth century when all of Gaza was Christian. So today they are sandwiched between Hamas, who of course control Gaza, and the Israeli, you know, very fierce restrictions of movement um, and the siege, the siege of Gaza, which is horrific. Um, so the book, I basically, um, all of my years of field work were then four intense, excuse me, intensive years of going back and forth between Syria, Iraq, um, Egypt, and Gaza to, to do my field work, to, to focus on these specific communities, and then to write this book, um, which when I got the Guggenheim Award, which helped me fund the trip, um, the trips back and forth, they said to me, this is a document of people who might not exist in a hundred years. And really that's what I'm trying to do. I want it to document people who for many reasons, mainly the rise of various extremist groups um, in Iraq, for instance, Iranian backed militias, Turkish backed militias, um, who want to exterminate them. Most recently, of course, the Islamic State. Um, so this, this vast persecution, but also, Peter, other, other factors, climate change. Climate change is really, really drastic in the region. Iraq is, I think, the fifth um, fifth on the list of the UN's most worrying uh, and most vulnerable places. Um, livelihood is threatened. When ISIS rolled through the Nineveh Plain, many of the Christians had farms and they destroyed their irrigation. Um, they burnt their farmland, they killed their cattle. Um, they basically just laid waste because they wanted to exterminate these Christians, these, these last of the Christians. So, Basically, that's what I do. I, I look at each of these four groups and I try to examine um, how they survive, what keeps them so rooted to their ancestral lands, which is ultimately their faith, their faith and their resilience. And then as I was writing it, as I actually sat down with all my notebooks and you know this process very well with your notebooks and your interviews and your tapes and COVID struck, and I was, um, I was basically, I took shelter in a village um, where my, the father of my son, Luca, um, comes from. Um, his family has lived in this village in the Alps for 400 years. And there's only about 20 people in the village. It's a farming village. Um, but I was sheltered in their ancient house with four of my French cousins who are devout, devout, devout Catholics. And so in the midst of all this, of this terrible uncertainty of COVID, um, I was living with these four, you know, <laughs> young Christians who literally their faith was getting them through this very drastic time. So in a way it became, the book became a document about these disappearing people, but it also became a testament to faith and, and to my own faith, because I had been brought up as a Catholic, as a Roman Catholic, um, a lapsed Catholic, probably not a very good Catholic in some ways, but I always maintained a very deep faith. And wherever I was in the world, whatever conflict I was reporting on, I always found churches, um, largely because, let's say during the siege of Sarajevo, um, 
in Sarajevo, going to the cathedral in the worst of the bombing, I felt a kind of peace and also a sort of strength and, and a unity with with other people in, in the community. So it was a very interesting process writing this book, probably more than any other book I've written. It was, it's very personal, um, but also tremendously rewarding to feel like I've gotten down on paper and in a book and it will never disappear. The oral history, the stories of these people. Um, so, that, so that's basically it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you mentioned that you're focusing on, on Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, because my, uh, my understanding is Christians make up about 10% of the Egyptian population, but did make up about 10% of the Iraqi population. I'm not sure what the percentage is on the Syrian. But of course, all of these people are being protected by essentially secular dictators. Yeah, yeah so what, is, what does that say? And, and, and uh uh you know now that saddam is gone what is the state of play for christians in iraq and now that you know that Assad is sort of it seems like he's here to stay what is the state of play in syria and, and now we have sisi in egypt who in many ways is yeah. more extreme than mubarak you know how does it how, how is it all playing out right now well one thing I also wanted to add, I didn't include Lebanon in this um, very deliberately because yeah. Christian Christian Christians in Lebanon, of course, are vital to the demographic and to the population, but they're very assimilated into the landscape, into the political system, into the social system, the economic system. The Christians I focused on are not. So let's look at the Iraqis first. When Saddam fell, um, more or less, I mean, there, there was this unofficial deal with the devil that, that Saddam protected the minorities. Tariq Aziz, of course, his, his uh, former foreign minister and his, his close advisor had been a Christian and they could live more or less, um, I won't say peacefully because no one lived in the Saddam time peacefully, but they, they felt protected, which is why they were terrified uh, when the American invasion was very close and with the with the what happened after with the rise of radical groups, Al Qaeda, who of course hadn't existed in Iraq before then, um, and the insurgency took on such a brutal and bloody form, and their churches started being attacked. Um, I remember the bombing of St. Mary's Chaldean Church in Baghdad and numerous others, and direct attacks upon them, which then led to 2014 and the Islamic State basically rolling into Mosul and um, subjugating the Christians, either offering them, and I say that um, with a kind of sarcasm because they basically either could convert, they could pay a tax or uh, they'd be killed. So, and many of them had to give up their factories, their farms. Um, some of the women were taken away um, to, to Raqqa as, sex slaves, um, their churches were burnt, destroyed. The crucifixes literally ripped from the steeples, trampled, the art trampled. Um, and then many of them fled. Uh, they, they took to the road as the villages, the Christian villages, which are kind of like a sequence um, going north of, of Mosul into the Nineveh plain. Um, they, they fled to monasteries. There were some monasteries, ancient monasteries, um, fourth century monasteries in the mountains where they, would, where they sought refuge, but many of them went to Kurdistan and oh. they, to Erbil. Um, and there is a suburb of Erbil called Ein Kawa, where they, I, I will never forget it. There's a statue of Our Lady in the middle of it. And they just, you know, slept hundreds and hundreds of people just slept under her statue, like looking for protection um, for weeks and on the steps of churches and inside the churches, um, really desperately frightened. And of course, ISIS reigned for, for a little bit more than two years. Um, and now they are slowly going back to their towns. The real fear in Iraq, but in all of these countries, Peter, is um, them leaving migration, because if they leave, then these, these ancestral lands will basically 
they will no longer, the Christians of Iraq, the Christians of Syria, the Christians of Gaza, they will no longer exist. And it's very difficult with numbers. Like we can never really get it accurate because the censuses aren't taken, but like roughly we think in the time of Saddam, there was about 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Now, the numbers I get are like between anywhere between 150,000 and 500,000. And I'd probably go more with 150,000. Um, wow. So radically shrinking, dwindling. Um, and where are they going? They're trying to go to America. They're trying to where many have families. They're trying to go to Canada. They want to go to Sweden, Germany, um, countries where they feel they can pray and worship without any kind of persecution. Um, but they're torn because their priests, their bishops say to them, I remember having this conversation um, with one of the Chaldean bishops in Baghdad. And he said, and it was right, it was literally June 2014 as ISIS was rolling across the Nineveh plain. I was in Baghdad and I immediately went to see him. And he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. They're, they're begging me for answers. They, they say, should we leave? Should we leave? But if they go, we will not have Christians in Iraq anymore. And without the Christians in Iraq, it's the same as without the Jews of Baghdad who were such a vital part of the fabric of Iraq who disappeared in the 50s. And then the community and who, the, the few that were left in the 70s. Um, and basically, I mean, I, I remember tracing one final family who were in hiding. And this was in the days of Saddam. So to lose this really important component of society is, is just absolutely devastating for, for, for Iraq, for Syria, for Gaza, for Egypt, but for the whole region. Um, Egypt is a very different situation. Well, I would say they are discriminated rather than persecuted. Of course, there's many attacks upon them um, at the monasteries, Christians riding in buses attacked by uh, suicide bombers by the radical groups um, in in the in the Sinai, but it is built into the laws of Egypt that Christians cannot build churches, so they can't build more churches. They can't um, serve in high level army positions or government positions, and of course, you know that the army is a, a mechanism, an arm of the state. So they're they're really excluded. Um, Although I would say, if you said to me, who are the most endangered? I would say probably the Gazans and the, uh, and the Iraqis. Um, so these are really ancient, vital people who are in danger of being wiped off the face of the earth. What do you think? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier these Shia militants in Iraq. Are they targeting Christians or they don't really care? No, they're targeting them. I mean, the, the big fear for the for the Christians is is the Turkish militia, militias further north, and and the Iranian um, backed militias. And of course, the elections in Iraq a few weeks back, um, there was you know there there was great fears amongst the Christian community that the Iraq the Iranian led parties would would do better than they actually did. But it as it turned out, very few people went to the polls, um, which shows uh, you know. Their, their faith, their confidence or lack of confidence in, in voting in government. Um, I think right now what people are trying to do is to survive. And I, I was in Egypt right before, literally right before COVID hit and, and, um, and locked it down. And I managed to go to Minya which is in upper Egypt. And that's really where many of the Christians live, but not the, not the wealthier Christians in, in Cairo who live in Heliopolis and who go to the French schools and who, who, whose lives I think are, they feel like they are others as they told me, but they're, they're not endangered. But when you go to the countryside, there you see the persecution. So I would see these churches that were literally um, locked up and people had nowhere to pray. I heard stories of people who had you know, the churches were burnt down. I heard stories of their homes being burnt down, of them not being able to get any work. Um, so 
real sense of, of, of fierce persecution in Egypt. In Gaza, it's, it's really desperate. And after the 11 day bombing, which was terrible in May, um, the Israeli attacks in Gaza, they, many of the tiny community um, who are largely Greek Orthodox, um, but some Roman Catholics as well, Eastern, Eastern Catholics, if they want it to leave, um, it's now got, gotten increasingly harder for any Gazans to get visas and papers to get out. And even for holidays like Christmas or Easter, when they want to go to Bethlehem, which is in the West Bank, to, to see their relatives, they, they're not being granted permits to go, or they'll get one permit for one member of the family. And of course they don't wanna, they have these large families, they don't wanna leave, they don't wanna celebrate Christmas alone or Easter alone. Um, several of the bookstore or one bookstore in particular, Baptist bookstore was burnt down um, a few years back. And so there, there is this fear that while Hamas claims to tolerate them and protect them, that more radical fringes want to see the end of this, this tiny but hugely important and historic um, community in Gaza. Um, and actually, I was in Gaza in July and August. I managed to get in. Um, and I was really surprised. It was the first time after all my years of being there that I went to an ancient monastery outside of the ruins of a monastery, I should say. I mean, there was archaeological ruins that I had never I had never been to before. So I began reading about the saints that had gone there to um, and who had lived there and the, the myths and the um, and it was it was really for me as someone you know that felt like I knew the region and knew the history of it. This whole other dimension of Christians in Gaza was was very new to me. Yeah, the the anti Christian uh, violence in, in Egypt began in this really in the seventies, I think, with the Jamaat Islamiyah, the Islamic group, and Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Yeah, That's, absolutely. You know, sort of issuing fatwas saying it was okay to kill Christians and. Uh, of course, he was the um, you know he went on to become the intellectual guide to the Trade Center bombers in 1993 in New York City. So, I mean, this this the violence against Christians in Egypt is long-standing, whereas in places like Iraq and uh, and, and maybe Gaza, it, it's more recent. Is that correct? Absolutely, and I think a lot of the people I talked to, because I tried to get a sort of cross section of ages of young people, but I spoke to a lot of people who told me that in this, it was the seventies when they first felt at university or in their jobs that they were really being targeted. And there would be, some of them had minor incidents such as, you know, they their ha homes were ransacked, but others felt directly threatened. And then in the eighties and nineties um, with the rise of more, of more radical groups in Egypt, um, there, there were direct attacks on them. You know, you remember the buses of the pilgrims that were that were attacked and people trying to go to the monastery of St. Catherine's in the desert, ancient monastery. And also there's a, a new factor, which you'll appreciate, Peter, which is with the Taliban being so emboldened with their victory, this has this sends a really clear message throughout the region, throughout the world, that you know, radical groups can actually, you know, can can take over governments, can, um, you know, that they, it, 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 I think it really, when I spoke to Christian friends after, after August, after the, the fall of Kabul, I, um, you know, it was amazing that they kept referring back to the Taliban victory and like what that would mean, how that would affect them, even though, of course, you know, they're, they're not on the doorstep of Afghanistan, but they did feel like this is going to send a direct message to our tormentors who will feel like now ISIS didn't wipe out the Christians here, but now, now maybe they will re regroup, rebrand, there'll be another attempt at this. So real feelings of vulnerability, of extreme vulnerability and, and of fear. Um, and in some ways, I mean, what really strikes me is the ones who don't leave and who stay, and even the ones who post June 10th, 2014, when, when ISIS took over, who did not leave their villages immediately. And it, it always strikes me 
why people stay. It's, it was almost like the scene at Kabul airport, you know, why did you stay till the last minute? I always ask people this and it's always the same response. They never think that their village, their town, their house, their community is going to be directly targeted. And by the time they realize that and they try to get out, it's too late. So yeah, I think that the Taliban, the Taliban effect will definitely affect um, these people. Let me uh, turn to, to some questions. And if you have a question in the audience, please uh, add it to the um, to the questions that I, which I'm uh, will will then ask Janine. So let me let me start with what has been Iran's approach to Christian religious communities in Syria and Iraq, as it asserts its influence in those countries and their wars on ISIS, and in Syria's case, the rebel movement more broadly. Is that for me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, what is Iran's view on Christianity? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. What's What's their approach to these communities in Syria and Iraq? Well, of course, Iran has an enormous influence in Iraq now, and um, you know, some of my Iraqi friends won't like me saying this, but you know, and increasingly, from um, I'm just I, I'm trying to remember a specific trip I did, and I think it was it was post. It was 2015, 2016, right after uh, ISIS had taken over and the rise of the Shia militias, um, which, you know, the, the Iraqi army essentially is almost entirely has a huge Shia um, population or, or, you know, it, within it. And I think that this is for these Christians, they see it as a threat. Um, the influence itself, I also remember going to like in, in 2016, right after ISIS fell, going to Katakosh, um, one of the villages and seeing, hearing Farsi spoken. And then I didn't see, you know, most people had not yet come out of their houses and the, the you know, most of the houses were destroyed. Um, but I saw a few women who had come from Iran and I remember thinking, what are they doing here? Um, and then seeing the, the um, Iranian backed militias, um, same in, in Syria. I think this is one of the biggest um, fears for them. Um, and, and in some ways it's existential and some ways it's absolutely physical because they are there, but there's also the greater threat of, you know, will in the coming years, because they really don't have protection. I mean, there are mechanisms within, within the Iraqi government to protect religious freedom. Um, but they don't feel protected. And you have to think if you sustain a trauma such as that one, um, and I'm talking about the recent ISIS, and they're only just coming back. Um, I had a report from someone in Syria, because I haven't been able to get there since, um, since COVID, since lockdown, um, that the churches are full, that the churches in, in Northeast Syria are full again. In Damascus, of course, it's a very different situation. So the Christians in Damascus, by and large, the ones that, and the regime side, the ones that I met supported Assad. Um, and they're, whether or not they tell me that out of fear, um, or whether they genuinely feel that he will protect them or whether they felt, especially during the time when the war in Syria was much more um, I mean, now I could say Assad won the war, right? We pretty much know that there's a very small part of Idlib that's still in the hands of, of the opposition who have been really terribly fractured. Um, but, but I would say the people then, the Christians I met in Damascus and Malula um, within the regime side all supported Assad. And I think that was partially fear, but partially they truly believed he would protect them. And they did not want a radical Sunni government coming in, which they saw would be detrimental to their interests entirely. So I hope that answered it. It was kind of a long yeah, yeah. answer yeah, on my yeah, part. I was gonna ask you about Syria because we hadn't touched on it uh, as much as Iraq and Egypt. Uh, and so in terms of percentages, what's the Christian population in Syria? I don't know now because, of course, the massive um, yeah. exodus and the displacement. So, you know, we've right. had 7 million refugees and 12 million 
12 million IGPs internally displaced people. And that includes, like for instance, I read a lot about this town called Malula, which is an extraordinary place. Um, it, it's an ancient, it's I'd say about not far from Damascus. And um, it had an ancient monastery there, which had been um, the sign of, uh, I think St. Takla. Um, and in pre-war times, it had been a center for women who had fertility problems to go and to pray and to make a pilgrimage there. Um, and during the war, at the beginning of the war, it basically shifted hands. It went from the, the nuns there. And again, it was quite shocking for me when I first went there at the very beginning of the war in 2012, 2011, 2012. And I sat with these nuns who literally said, you know, we love Bashar, we love Bashar. And I was trying to, you know, say, look, you know, you don't have to be frightened, I won't write, but do you actually love Bashar? Do you know what he's doing right now in, in Duma and in, in Homs and in Aleppo? You know, do you know he's using tactics of starvation or surrender? And do you know he's chemically gassing his people? That would come later in 2013. But they literally, they loved him. They saw him as a savior. And Bashar, of course, is a Shia, um, an Alawite, sorry, an Alawite, which is a, a branch of, of Shia, kind of mystical branch of Shia. So perhaps it was that they felt closer in terms of, of uh, faith. Perhaps they felt that he could protect them. But for whatever reason, Malula then shifted hands so many times. It went into the Free Syrian Army hands. It went into ISIS, overran it. Um, it then went back to government hands. Um, and many of the people that I spoke to there fled. So they got out. And because, of course, that side of Syria, the regime side, is so close to Lebanon, and there were there were uh, roads you could take, but also there were smugglers' routes, so people could could get in and out quite not easily, of course, but they could get out that way. And many of the Christians I met and spoke to um, early on in Malula, Malula fled. So numbers, Peter, really hard to determine. Yeah. Um and so in the United States, uh, amongst a lot, uh, quite a number of Christians, I mean, Vice President Pence, apparently the only foreign policy issue he really cared about was yeah. the persecution of Christians in the Middle East. Um, but I mean, more broadly, clearly this is an issue for, uh, you know, all sorts of Christians um, that want to do something about this issue. I mean, A, is there anything that can be really done? Sounds like from what you're saying, not much. And B, uh, to what extent is this an issue that is uh, amongst, say, observant or fundamentalist Christians? Is it a big issue or a small issue or what? Really good point. And, you know, one thing I was so worried about whilst I was writing it, the Muslim ban came into effect. Um, 2017, 2016, 2017. Um, and 20 2016, 2016. Um, it, it came into effect immediately after Trump assumed office. So January 30th, 2017, I think is the date. 2017. Um, what really worried me was that, of course, Christians were excluded from that. That. Yeah. So I, my immediate thought was, great, this means we're going to have good refugees and bad refugees. And because I worked for the UN Refugee Agency during the Syrian war um, in Lebanon, Turkey, and Egypt, um, you know, I know how no one wants to be a refugee. No one. I've never met in my 35 years of reporting conflict rep from refugees in the former Yugoslavia, all over Africa. Um, I've never met anyone that said, yeah, I'm leaving my country because I really want to go to Sweden or Germany or the US. It's always an act of sheer desperation. So by Trump creating the Muslim ban, I was terribly worried it would create this, you know, stigma of good good refugees who would be the Christians that would come here and be taken up by evangelical communities and the bad refugees, the Muslim. Um, the evangelical Christians, strangely enough, um, I thought there'd be much more support for Christians in the Middle East. I mean, there are obviously um, evangelical groups that do go there. Of course, um, you find that everywhere. Even in Gaza, I came across um, Baptists. Baptists and, and um, Lutherans, Lutheran less evangelical, 
but um, Baptist communities of, of um, fundamentalist Baptists. So, you know, this goes back to the ancient traditions of, of conversion and, um, and of proselytizing. So there was a point to your question. So the, this is about the, oh, Pence. Well, so, so, so for Pence, and I'm yeah. using him to as an example, yeah. I mean, for him, this was a, a big issue. Uh, to what extent is it an issue amongst fundamentalist Christians in the United States? And what, if anything, can be done about it? And what, if anything, is the Vatican doing about any of this? Another point, by the way, is that Bush, who invaded a Muslim country, isn't, isn't a born again Christian. Um, and he actually used, if you remember, quite unfortunately, the term crusades. Do you remember that? And then he retracted it. Um, but so, and, and this is your area, really. But, you know, after the invasions of Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, there was massive bad tidings throughout the Middle East that Christian countries were invading Muslim countries. And of course, this wasn't completely accurate. It wasn't accurate at all. I don't think the logic behind it was that we're, we're on a second crusades or a fifth crusades. It was, it was simply that um, this is how they took it. You know, these are Christian presidents and they are coming to Muslim countries and subjugating us. Um, Pence is an interesting case because I remember coming back from one of my trips and going to his office to brief his, his chief of staff about the situation there and how desperate it was. And I think he genuinely, um, he's a Catholic, I believe, but an evangelical Catholic, isn't he? Or he was a Catholic and he's now evangelical. Uh, I, I don't think he's a Catholic, but he, he's certainly a fundamentalist Christian. So. He's fundamentalist. Um, he had a great, I mean, he's spoken at In Defense of Christians, which is the big, one of the big, uh, advocacy groups in Washington, D.C., who has, have a massive conference every year. Um, he had been keynote, a keynote speaker. He, he genuinely, I think, had a concern for it. But I think largely most churches in America don't even know these people exist. I think they really, you know, they read the Bible. They know about the land of the Holy Land, and they know about um, uh, that Jesus Christ was brought to Egypt when he was a child with with Mary, um, they know about Christians in Galilee. They know about uh, uh, they might know about Assyrians and Chaldeans, and that Ar Aramaic is still spoken. But they don't know their plight. So, what could be done? I think the the first thing is solidarity. And the Pope Pope Francis's visit last March at the height of COVID, um, I, I respect that man so much. I mean, I know that the Catholic Church has taken a terrible battering and horrific, horrific sex, sexual um, scandals against children, pedophilia. I, I mean, it just, it's heartbreaking. But he, I think, to, to go to Iraq at that time, and that was, that was a bad time. People were dying, vaccines weren't available. Um, and to say mass, brought such a message of hope to those people. And I, I know that sounds cliche, a message of hope, but it truly, truly did. Um, it was because they feel so isolated and they feel so cut off and they feel so absolutely forgotten. Um, and what he did was basically say, we're watching you, you know, we've got your back. That, and I do think, and I don't mean a massive, you know, 100,000 boots on the ground, but I think, American policy should continue to have some kind of engagement in northeastern Syria. There, the the fabric of Iraq, and you know, um, I remember a very high-ranking Iraqi official saying to me, "Without Christians in Iraq, there is no Iraq. Um, without the this kind of multicultural mix, um, you lose so much. Not just the culture itself." But the, the entire demographic and to have a homogenized society is not something anyone wants, not in Iraq, not in Egypt, not in Israel, Palestine, not in Bahrain. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a question of whether or not a society is going to become completely homogenized or whether it will have these diverse, distinct communities that bring so much to the table. Uh, Peter, you just disappeared. <laughs>
Oh, there you are. Now you're at the bottom of the screen instead of the top. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I just reconnected because I think okay. that's where it was a problem. Um, you know, what, so did, like, the broader question was, you know, obviously this is all con happening in the context. If you go back to the 70s of the Sawa, the Islamic awakening in the Middle East, it kind of swept the region. Um, and you now, you mentioned the Taliban being in power in Afghanistan. Obviously you have a Shia fundamentalist state uh, in Iran and now the Sunni fundamentalist state in, in Afghanistan. At the same time, you have, you know, Mohammed bin Salman essentially creating a more secularized uh, Wahhabi state. So it's not like there's completely static, but I mean, the broad picture is of an Islamist uh, awakening. Um, and, you know, one of the big changes since 9-11, I think, is the rise of sectarianism. And do you think that kind of is that related in a way to the rise of this sort of anti-Christian yeah, obviously, there's always been sectarianism in the Middle East of one form or another. There's probably been anti-Christian uh, elements in the Middle East at one point you know, or another, depending on when you select your historical period. But is there something different about the present era, the post 9-11 era, the post sawa era that is creating all these conditions, which is making the Middle East, in a sense, uh, much more of a monoculture? Whether it's a Sunni monoculture or Shia monoculture, uh, you know, getting the Christians leaving, the Jews have already left. The Middle East, in a way, the Ottoman Empire, you could make the argument, it was did pretty well on the issue of kind of at least allowing everybody to practice their own religions more or less as they chose. So what what are the big historical forces here that have created this the situation that you were exploring in each of these ind individual countries? Well, I mean, the one thing I would say though, because I'm, I'm very wary of pitting this in a sense, which is what this would fall into the hands of the evangelicals and of the Trumpists and of, you know, that Christians cannot live alongside Muslims. Um, I, I, I don't think that's true because I think for centuries they have. Um, and there are plenty of Muslims, you know, communities in Baghdad where Christians lived alongside Shias, Sunnis, and they were neighbors, they were friends, they, it, it worked. Um, I think there's always been tensions, but for me, 9-11 changed everything. Um, I even look at the way I reported wars, the wars I covered in the 90s and the wars post 9-11 were entirely different. And they, they were led by much more of a, a radicalization a kind of call to action. And, you know, I lived in France for, for many, many years until very recently. Um, and there I studied radicalization and, and how, how easily, um, but also how believably um, a young person could become radicalized because they felt so detached from French society, French or British, same if you're, you know, a Pakistani living in the North of England, or I am, by, by the way, saying this, I am in no way condoning any kind of violence or any kind of violent non-state actor. I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to see how these things emerge. And 9-11 basically changed the way the world looks, the way we view the, the lens through which we view the Middle East. Um, it then gave rise to forces of these various insurgency groups, but also radicalism which is fueled by social, social media and the internet. Because if you look back pre 9-11, I mean, I remember going to Afghanistan with a, you know, one of those big cell phones and you couldn't, you know, you didn't have internet on it. There was no, it's very hard. It's interesting. My students at Yale were all born, you know, during 9-11 or right after 9-11. And they literally don't understand that we didn't have internet in the 90s, in 1995, or that um, we, we you know, might've had, I got my first cell phone, I think in, um, in 2000, but it, you know, you couldn't, we didn't know what was going on. We weren't connected to the world. Well, radicalization post 9-11 as internet and as technology grew enabled people, the ease at which someone sitting in a suburb of Paris could connect with the head of a cell in Toulouse, who could then connect him with someone in Turkey, 
to get him a lift into Syria. So it's it's so uh, it's so easy to become more radicalized now, and I think that is what happened with ISIS. You know, one of the many forces that happened with ISIS, and and that led to the latest. Um, I don't want to say attack because it was much more of an attack wave of uh, an attempt to exterminate Christianity in, in Iraq and Syria. Gaza, a different story, because of course there we've got Hamas and, and Israel, both responsible for this absolute oppression, persecution, discrimination of this tiny community. And Egypt, as you say, you know, with the rise and rise of, of radical groups, Christians are, aren't wanted. I mean, they're I think in Egypt, they're tolerated amongst a certain level of society, but they're not wanted. And I think to live amongst people increasingly who do not want you to be there is a terrible position to raise your children, to stay, it's to stay in lands that, that essentially are historically Christian. Going back in time a little bit, I mean, you covered the Bosnian War. In a sense, that was a reverse of the situation where Serbian Christian, I think they saw themselves as Christian yeah. uh, paramilitaries, you know, massacred Muslims and that war. Turks. Went on. They called them Turks. Turks. So they, you know, that war went on for many years and was very bloody. Uh, did that help spark some of this kind of mutual aminosities? Uh, I mean, certainly we saw veterans of the Afghan war showing up in, in Bosnia to, yeah. to kind of defend their fellow Muslims against the attacks of the Serbs. So was this part of the prehistory of all this? It's really interesting you say this because I'm teaching my Yale students now. I teach a course which is called Four Conflicts and it's um, Bosnia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone and Kosovo. And it's all linked by humanitarian intervention or the lack of it. And we're on Kosovo now. and. I told them yesterday that the first time I really met foreign fighters um, was in Northern Bosnia near Zenica, I'd say around 1994, 1995, there were Afghan fighters there, small, small units of Mujahideen that had, that had come overland and were fighting with the Bosnian Muslims. But remember that Sarajevo had been completely multicultural. Of course there were pious, Muslims there, but the majority, I'm speaking about my friends personally, were Muslims who didn't really pray. They had been converted in the 15th century by the Turks. They were more, I'd say culturally um, Muslim, but they, they absolutely were not um, in any way religious. Post-war Bosnia, Saudi money, of course there was an arms embargo too, which, um, which kind of alerted other Muslim countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi to rush to their aid. If you go to Sarajevo today, it is a very different city than the Sarajevo pre-war. There are more mosques. There is an enormous Saudi built mosque. There are women wearing hijabs. I mean, Sarajevo, it was women in mini skirts. And you know, now it's much more pious. Um, there is a, much more control. I have friends who called me in tears, Muslim friends, because their children, um, Santa Claus wasn't allowed to come to their school um, because the you know, more religious Muslims took offense at that. These are Muslim friends that called me in tears saying, you know, if this is what the future of Bosnia is like, it's not a place I want to be. So the Bosnian war fueled um, absolutely, you know, religious tensions that I think didn't exist before. There were other tensions there. There were, you know, more ethnic tensions, tribal tensions, uh, resentment and vengeance from World War II, historical remnants that hadn't been settled, land issues. But it wasn't about, it wasn't about being a Muslim or a Christian until the Serbs took up this mantle of of the Orthodox Church, and of course, got backed by Russia, who are Orthodox as well. So it became Christian versus the Turks, as they called them, as they called the Bosnian Muslims. Yeah, and I mean, and, and as you say that, of course, you know, Putin has really married himself to the Orthodox Church and mm -hmm. sort of made, um, and and the war in Chechnya was certainly conceived. I mean, it, not dissimilar to the Bosnian War, where Afghan Mujahideen showed up. Uh, there was it was certainly. Um, a conflict that 
that both sides saw as a civilizational religious conflict. And, and you know, it's funny, and I was telling my students this, Kosovo, so Kosovo was 99. The Bosnian War ended in 95. Kosovo started in 99. It was, of course, a 78-day NATO-led campaign. It was the first time in my many years of working in Muslim countries that I went to sleep in a tent with, I was, I was attached to a unit of KLA, the, the Kosovo Liberation Army fighters. And I went to take my sleeping bag and crawl in a tent. And the men complained and they were, they, they were foreign fighters from Saudi, Chechnya. And I think one was from Afghanistan, but I have never, that has never happened to me up until that point. You know, no one had ever said, she's a woman, she can't stay. And they were like, you can't, you know, go sleep outside. <laughs> you can't be here. Um, and then interestingly enough, I remember in Aleppo in 20, Aleppo fell in 2016. So it must've been about 2014, 2013, 2014, um, seeing again, the foreign fighters, the rise of uh, the Free Syrian Army being hijacked by um, various extremist groups and staying in a house full of fighters and they wouldn't let myself and the female photographer I was working with come out of the room while they were there. They brought our food and they left it outside the door and they knocked on the door and we could take our food. And we, we weren't allowed to go in the room with them, even covered with hijabs and dressed appropriately. And I remember thinking on a personal level as a reporter, how difficult it was going to be for me to work in, in these situations. Um, and of course, Afghanistan now. Um, will revert back to what I remember from the pre, uh, you know, the pre, uh, pre 2001, how difficult it was to work amongst the, when the Taliban were in power at that stage. Yeah. And I mean, as we have the final closing minutes here, I mean, what can be done? I mean, is this just a, something that's just a, a force of nature, which is, because I mean, what you're describing is sort of decades of the situation just never getting any better, and in fact, getting worse and worse and worse. So, is there anything? Yeah. As a solution to this. Well, first of all, I wish I really, truly wish, and it's not just for book sales, but I wish every church would read my book so that they could get the pop the, the their parishioners to um, to not just take up collections, but we do need industry to be built in in these places because we want the young people to stay um the biggest worry amongst the the elders there is that the young people graduate from college um or even high school and there is no industry so we need to kind of support them economically in the way not giving them money but giving them factories building factories um educating you know making sure there's more universities specifically in the christian areas um, you know, so so trying to support them in that way so that they have livelihoods, especially with climate change. So the farmlands drought, um, the people who live off livelihoods from the rivers, the great rivers, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, of course, like the fishermen, the fishing communities there have been greatly affected by climate change. So, you know, climate change um, is supporting industry and education and awareness and solidarity, you know, knowing, trying to keep them in these lands. Um, and again, each country is unique. Egypt is different from Gaza. Gaza is different from Syria and Iraq. But I think basically we need solidarity and, and to have a, a, a solid American um, policy, not just a tiny unit of religious freedom, but really, you know, actively engaged in the region, having fact-finding missions, sending people like me to do reports about what is needed, where are the gaps, what do these people need, how can we keep them in their, in the lands that they have lived in for 2000 years since the time of Christ. Um, it really is vital and it's really urgent. Well, on that note, uh, Janine's new book, The Vanishing, The Twilight of Christianity in the Lands of, of the Prophets. Thank you very much, Janine, for the brilliant presentation. And um, please go and buy her book. <laughs> and uh, thanks for tuning in. And thank you, Janine, for sharing uh, some of your all the many years of work that went into doing you know doing this book. So thank you. Thank you, Peter.